Okay, let's get talking, everyone. Uh, it's been a wonderful day so far, and uh, we're believing it will continue to be that. But uh, we can't also stop having uh, this very critical conversation about where we are today with the states of security across this country. And as I said at the top of the program this morning, the killing of 43 farmers in Berenu State has again, uh, as it were, revived the calls for uh, rejigging of uh, the security architecture uh, in this country. Even though some persons say, well, uh, it has never been anything better than political statements, uh, essentially. Others are saying it is a special time for us, and as such, the approach as well uh, must be special. I have with me civil rights activist, Reverend Olu Martin. It's always a pleasure to have you with Good us morning. on the program. Good to be on ITV again. Okay, let, let's get it uh, straight up uh, on the road. The Boko Haram, as, uh, as, as a deadly sect, uh, has been here with us for nothing less than a decade straight. And people are now wondering, what exactly is that that makes it so challenging to deal with this deadly sect? I, I, do, I don't think that there is much to wonder about hmm. because everywhere in the world, war is a profitable venture. It was Patrick Henry that said, and I quote, that the people have two problems criminals and government. The difference between government and criminals is that government is restrained by laws and the constitution. The moment you remove law and constitution from government, what you have is legitimate criminals, what Fela calls vagabonds in power. Because if you give a police a gun and there are no rules of engagement, that police is worse than the criminal that comes to waylay you in your house. Because at least the criminal that comes to waylay you, as soon as he's coming, you know he's a criminal. But if a police comes and he doesn't follow rules of engagement, you will dress down, you will relax your guard, because this is, you think that this guy should protect you. So Abbasan just said that a nation, a house is in trouble if your gate man is your thief. Because he's helping you to look for all the things that are missing. But the things that are missing are right with him in his gatehouse. Now, I've said all of that to say that when you have a nation where people are profiting from war, I can tell you from investigation, because I mean, I am also into properties. I can point to a couple of houses built by military men in this Benin city. And it's not just in Benin city. Some of the biggest investments, you will see some of them are manned by one or two you know, private uh, one or two uh, military men there, these big facilities built by these military men, these big facilities built by military men. So clearly, it's that people are making profit from war, especially when you say you cannot properly investigate the amounts that have been budgeted and released for security. You, you can never see a security probe because they say, oh, a security probe means that you are telling you are telling potential invaders hmm. of your territorial in integrity the things that you have. So in a sense, it becomes classified. It becomes it's, it's classified. Hmm. And then in the guise of classifying, classified information, a whole lot of people are moving out. And I mean, you say you want to buy a Tucano jet, you want to buy this, you want to, we're just here. The processes of procurement, we don't know about it because it's classified. And people are making profit from war. And once you make profit from war, there's no how you can you know, defeat um, um, a Boko Haram. I'll, I'll tell you why this is interesting. Uh, we've heard about uh, attempts to collaborate, I mean, strike some kind of partnerships with foreign governments, including the United States and the United Kingdom, for example, even before this government. It's been same old, same old. W has there ever been a time where there was sincerity of purpose in fighting insurgency in this country? I don't think that there's been any sincerity of purpose in fighting in dealing with anything in this country, except when it affects, quote and unquote, the ruling class itself, as in the case of Ebola virus. Mm. Even recently, we were warned as to what is happening with coronavirus. Nobody hears anything. I'm hearing that uh, Mohamed Bala, the FCT minister, is saying that 28.7 billion mm. has been spent in the federal capital territory to, for the COVID-19 protocols. So you now wonder, what do we seriously you know, attack? So I, I'm not sure that I've seen 
sincerity of purpose in whatever we do in this part of this country. And it's not far fetched. Professor Lumumba, um, they are anti Mm. Grafts um, in Kenya. Yeah, in Kenya. Mm. Says that how do you keep goats with hyenas? And you are surprised that the hyenas are eating the goats. That's what you should expect. So when you have the crop of leadership that Africa has, Dito Nigeria, businessmen to the core, who don't care about the welfare of Nigerian people. All they care about is how can they add Nigeria as a part of their private you know, estate. So if a man, for instance, goes to the market and he says, okay, this is your laptop, and he's able to buy it for um, 85000 for instance, and then he comes to a place and people are able, to, I want to sell it for 150000 He wants to maximize profits. Some people may oh, I, it's, some people say, oh, it's cheating. But for him, he doesn't care. For him, is the fact that how can I get the best profit? The majority of our political leaders and those who formulate policy and force policy, many of them, all they are after is how they can line you know, their private pocket. That's why you have those kind of individuals in the corridors of power. Because one of the things that power helps you to do is to aggregate public resources and manage it for the greater good. There's no individual who has enough money mm -hmm. to be able to manage his estate. How much less to say the whole of the nation. So we now say, okay, there's public money. That public money is not in the hands of a governor. It's not in the hands of, a, of whoever it is. He now aggregates it for the greater good. So you can imagine that if that guy doesn't care. Like, because they say leadership, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. In this part of the world, care has been deficient. So when care is deficient, you really cannot see sincerity of purpose. You hear different agencies of government saying different things at the, the same... About the same issue. Oh, about, about the same issue. The DSS will have something else to say. Um, this other agency will have something else to say. The um, army would have you know, something else to say. The spokesperson to the president will have something else to say. And you're wondering why can't there be harmony? Today, Boko Haram has been technically decimated. When you look at the records of death, people are saying, oh, you know, Boko Haram transformed themselves into bandits and into... I was listening to Balam El Rufai 2016. He was not in office then, and he made a profound statement. I still listen to his social media. That let nobody deceive you. Say, I was FCT minister. And as FCT minister, I was receiving torrents of security information. He says the president receives 50 that, 50, 50 times more mm. than what he was receiving as FCT minister. And quoting him, he says that the DSS, director of DSS, and the president know those who are in charge or those people who are sponsored in Boko Haram. Quoting Malam, that's where Erufa. I don't Fast forward, Malam, that's where Erufa is now part of the All Progressive Congress. If you like, the ruling party, and the language has changed. It's a different ball game entirely. Many of them will even go and deny some of those statements they had made. Because if you if you go by what Malam, that's where Erufa said, it is safe to say mm. the security agents, especially the top end chelon of security agents, the DSS, the police, and uh, the army, know what is happening in you know Boko Haram but because there's no sincerity of purpose some of some people I dare say uh, maybe not them there are some people who profit from war a man who makes coffin do you think it will be sad that a plane people crashed not too far from uh, where where people are crying for him that is business so it's like one of my pastor friends who in the prophetic mode asked people to come with their work tools and people came with bikes people came with spanners and a mechanic and one guy came with a uh, coffin and it has no, 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 people can come to this altar and carry a book. But I'm work with that. I, I know some people are going to die, so you can imagine somebody makes coffee. He's going to be happy that, you right. know, people are dying. So if people sell guns because the um, light weapons and small arms business mm. is very porous, especially in, in, in West Africa, you go to Church Republic mm -hmm. with as little as 3,000 naira, you can get an AK 47. How much less a Barretta pistol? How much less a revolver? You can, you can, you know, almost get them off, you know, at one point in time in what it was like that. So you can imagine those who profit from selling guns, they will promote such wars because that's where they are profiting. I, I, I'm hearing now that the, the, the incident, the very dastardly acts in Burundi State, the killing of 43 farmers, has brought an entirely different curve into the conversation about counterinsurgency efforts. Of course, we're not hearing that even the, the House of Reps is 
calling on the president, inviting the president categorically to come explain to the House and, of course, by extension, Nigerians, the reason we're still stuck in the woods in the fight against insurgency, particularly in the Northeast. Don't you think this is a different layer altogether to the conversation? Oh, I mean, absolutely. I heard the um, Minister for Information say, and I, I find it a little bit unbelievable, that farmers need to get clearance mm -hmm. from the military. Yeah, I think it was credited to Gabashe, the yeah. senior special yeah, assistant to, to the president. Get, yeah, you need to on get media. clearance mm. before they go to their farms. We do not even look at the economic implications. Clearance from the military. Right, military before they can go to mm. their farms. You do not even understand the um, uh, economic implication of that. But let's even look at that statement in its own um, assistance. What it means is that if you must go to your farm, the military must tell you whether the location that you are going to farm. Nobody farms in the whole of Brown State. Mm. There are pockets of farms everywhere. So what it means is that the military are not sure that Boko Haram have been flushed from XYZ person's farm in XYZ person's place. So if you say, I want to go to my farm now, I have to get clearance. The military will now go there to be sure I can enter into the place. And mm. then you tell us that that same Boko Haram has been technically you know, defeated. The fact that we can have 43 farmers Think about the impact of 43 farmers and what they farm. Think about the impact it can have on our food chain. So it's changed the whole of the dimensions, you know, entirely. I mean, I, mean, I thought it was a joke, but I went to buy um, roasted meat, what we call suya, mm. a, a couple of times. And I found out to my utmost chagrin that you know, they put onions again. Mm -hmm. I, I thought people were joking. Somebody jokingly said it's now used for engagement rings or something. Yeah, I mean, I've seen all, but, but the reality is that just a few days ago, I still didn't find, you know, onions, and that's how, you know, onions, you know, has become um, scarce. So I, I'm a little bit, you know, worried. I hope that the House of Bread can put bite hmm. to the things that they want to do. I've heard um, the Senate ask Mr. President, how be it lethargically hmm. for him to relieve the appointment of the service chiefs. service chiefs. I'm sure we will get to that. Right. But I, I, I hope that this president will answer the call of the House of Representatives. Because uh, in 2016, Mr. President, as General Mohammed Buhari said that President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan at that time should resign. That must have been before 2016 because he was already president in yeah, 2016. Yeah, before 2016, mm. during the build up to 2016 right. you know, campaign. Mm -hmm. That the president should at that time should resign because of insurgency that is not as bad as it is today mm. so if he could make that statement it is clear that we can also tell him that president Muhammad Buhari, if at that time you are asking Guru Kebele Jonathan to resign it is also safe and you know uh, 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 comfortable to say you have done worse in terms of results that doing. you should also you know resign so uh, it is but a whole new um, dimension to the whole um, conversations and we need the National Assembly to indeed be the National Assembly except for when this president goes to present the budget to a joint session of the National Assembly we have not seen them having the muscle the temerity the courage to say mr. president you have to tell us what is happening to Nigeria and that's not far-fetched the way many of them became um, emerge as, as leadership, you know, of the house. You can imagine if this was happening during the Bukola Saraki um, Senate leadership. I'm sure you would that have been a different conversation. At well, at least, at least, I'm sure that because at that time uh, they didn't seem to be in cahoots. I'm sure that certain information would have been thrown up, and then maybe there have been a lot, you know, more forceful. Look at what happened to uh, Abaribe for even daring to suggest that these actions of this Mr. President are impeachable offenses. He didn't say they were going to go ahead to impeach him. They just said they were impeachable offenses. Look at the barrage of criticism and then the attempt to even set the person, you know, set, you know, Abaribe up. So mm. I think that it's a whole new conversation, you know, economically it's beginning to affect our, it's going to affect, you know, our food chain because some of that, several other farmers are not going to be able to go to the farm. I mean, look at um, Christmas is coming and rice has, you know, shot up, you know, to high heaven Mm. And trust Nigerians, they're also looking for ways, you know, to. So I agree with you that um, the conversation is, is, is becoming 
um, um, is becoming more daring. It looks like the chicken is coming home to roost because, like my father used to say, when you have too much sand in the soup of a blind man, nobody he, he finds out. Yeah, and, and, and speaking of sand and soup now, I mean, metaphor, metaphor, metaphorically, you now have more people calling for circle service chiefs, including officially the Nigerian Governors Forum led by Ekiti State Governor, Mr. Kayode Faime. And then, of course, even uh, groups from the north are now saying that look we can't continue like this it, it takes somebody who is insane or mentally challenged overall to want to do the same thing the same way and expect yeah, a different yeah, outcome yeah. or altogether it appears there's more force now for the sack of the service chiefs however the question perhaps is will sacking the service chiefs and replacing them solve the problem of insecurity in the country even though now we understand that the presidency is coming out forcefully to say look the president reserves the prerogative absolutely to hire and fire. So these gentlemen serve at his pleasure. So how do we create a balance in this circumstance? Uh, well, the beauty, the beauty is that you have used a statement that I like, at his pleasure. Mm. When people say sack the service chief, and perhaps I'm up for it, what we seem to forget is the fact that the president is president and commander in chief of the armed forces of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. In other words, so he's number one service chief. Mm. All of the things that transpire, the service chief come to brief him. All the information, this Nigeria security architecture, and the decisions they're in end at the table of Mr. President. I've said it again and again that the presidential system of government is a very funny president. It's a, it's a very funny system of government. Actually, where you have a behemoth in Nigeria called the federal government, where the powers of Mr. President are almost inelastic. There's almost what this Nigerian president cannot do by the constitution of the Federal Republic you know, of Nigeria. Mm. Uh, so I, I, I said all of that to say, is what the president wants done that happens. The attitude of the president will rub off on the bulk of the pe people who are his aides. Look at uh, outgoing president of the United States of America. Look at his, uh, his uh, chief counsel. Look at the way he talks. Look at the people who are in his media. Many of them are talking like Trump. They are, you know, arrogant. They are arrogant. They is that also an issue of body language, as we say? No, that, that is the presidential system of government. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If your president or governor specializes in chicanery and buffoonery, it's going to rub off on his followers. Look at what was happening. I mean, and I don't, no pun intended, during the time of Comrade Adam Sashomoli. There were people who were going about on their vehicles, eh? uh, son of the, the first son of the governor. Uh, there were uh, a boss that I saw, uh, sister of uh, one of the people, <laughs> one of the people that notoriously did business with government. We know how chaotic this state was. Why? Because people felt that if you had a, a governor that was quote unquote anyhow, you are going to have followers that are also anyhow. It's the same thing with Nigeria. So I am wondering what is the intention of this president. And I'm saying so because we have had a president that has deliberately demonstrated that it is not sensitive to the priority of Nigeria as far as the, um, as far as the appointment of service chiefs are concerned. 90% of them are from one part of uh, the country. And that part of the country is the worst hit. We have had a president that has you know, demonstrated that he probably doesn't care about his own people. In Bruno State, the president sent a delegation. He did not go himself. One, something would happen in some other country. Three or five people are affected. I are affected. The president himself would move there to assess the situation. So you're going to ask yourself, um, this president appears to be interested in what is happening in the Niger Republic. We want to import petrol from the Niger Republic. We want to have a railroad in the, to the Niger Republic. We want to have a, 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 a farm tank in the Niger Republic. So you'll be asking yourself, when you now sit down with the president, what is the body language of the president? Because if you say, ask, sack the service chief, the new service chief that will come in will answer to the commander in chief of the armed forces. I'm up for the sacking of the service chief, but I fear that if we sack service chiefs, what is just going to happen is that they're not going to have new, fresh hands. However, that you will have new wine in old wine skin. The, what we must start asking is that we must, they are, what they're doing is that they're playing the ostrich. They don't want to confront the president directly. People are forgetting that the president is the commander in chief mm -hmm. and that all that happens ends on the bulk you know, of the table. So instead of saying sack 
the service chief. We should be asking for the president to resign. And that would be, that would be, it is, it is within our prerogative to say, if we elected you to protect life and property, and you have not done so, then you should resign. Uh, Professor Aguirre, former vice chancellor, told us that time, I mean, former deputy vice chancellor in Epoma, told us that time, when some of us were suspended as student union leaders and were asking, no, we're sus our studentship was suspended. And if you're not a student, you can't be a student union leader. Obviously. And the man told us and said, listen, eh, your, a man's cap falls to the left, his head falls to the right, and he can only pick one. What does he pick? Of course, the question is, uh, has, the answer is inside. He can only pick mm -hmm. his head. Because if he picks his cap, there'll be no head you know, so, to, to, to put the cap on. See, so you know what? So pick your head. Your head is your studentship and move on. Mm. If we go and be, the clamor for the resignation of Mr. President heightens, the, Mr. President understands that he is a former, he's a retired general, a warlord at that who has been involved at in several stages of Nigeria's war, both within and with. I think the clamor should not be for the for the change of the service chief. Mm. The clamor should be, Mr. President, if you cannot protect your people, you majority will just resign. Go, go, governor, governor Zulum of uh, Brunei State is probably the most distressed governor in Nigeria today for apparent reasons. And I don't envy him at all. Yes, and, and, and people are now saying that, look, this man needs as much help as he can get, not just for him and his state, but for Nigeria and in particular for the northeastern part of the country. And now he's saying, look, can we not get mercenaries into this war? To, to be able to run circles around uh, Boko Haram and other similar elements in, in the region. And now we see people, uh, including governors, for example, lending their voices to that same call. But there have been some military, former military leaders now saying, look, that again is a problem in itself. Because the situation we're dealing with is more like a Pandora's box that has been opened uh, in this country. And then there's, there's some reports saying there's a history of inviting mercenaries to fight insurgency in, in, in Nigeria. Are we doing this out of desperation, or is it the only option that's open to us? I, I, I think that we have run out of um, ideas, um, either deliberately or indeliberately. Hmm. Remember that uh, the president of Chad, by himself at one point in time, led the onslaught against Boko Haram insurgents. Right. So much so that the um, inglorious, infamous leader, Shakao, hmm. was crying out for help. I'm told that in one fell swoop, over 1,000 Boko Haram insurgents yeah, were, neutralized. were neutralized. In one fell swoop, led by the president of Chad himself. And then they reached out for collaborations. After a while, they themselves pulled back because the kind of seriousness that they expected from the side of the Nigerian army wasn't forthcoming. This is not the first time where we are having um, um, anti-terrorist trained people coming from America. I don't think we had about 60 of them. Mm. They're not saying that they want to go to the field, all right? It is your terrain. You know it better because America has become wiser because of Cambodia and Vietnam. Mm -hmm. let's, just, let's just look at what you have on ground. Let's have collaboration. But because there's hidden agenda, do not forget that this APC before now, especially when uh, Lai Mohammed was a spokesperson of the APC, said that the proscription of uh, Boko Haram was unconstitutional and it was illegal. So if you have uh, those kind of people, you will look as if some people have some kind of ethnic sentiment in that regard. So it, it, it except we come out determined to fight Boko Haram and we do it in all honesty, we will not have collaborations. Chad isn't as well endowed financially and in terms of manpower as Nigeria is. But the president of Chad can go personally wearing his uniform as the commander in chief, as the field marshal of the Chadian army, and achieve several results. Many of the guys, Boko Haram guys, who are operating on the other side of Chad comfortably moved to the Nigerian because side. Because it was safer for them. Yeah, it was safer for them. Moved to the Nigerian side of it. And they are operating uh, without, uh, with little, you know, uh, or no restrictions. Mm. Uh, many of them have transformed. The state of Mr. President Kassina State, incidentally, I think that the governor may even be more distraught than Governor Zulum of um, Brown State. Brown state mm. Because it is, in, it is here that we recognize borders. It is in... Uh, uh, Places that you say, okay, uh, you have borders in Seme, you have borders, you go to the north. You will just, from here to ITV gate, it's Chad, it's Cameroon. 
no no custom officers some of us have been there no custom officers no immigration officer so it's a seamless border you just move in you move out as you know you like so you have that kind of situation there definitely is that it has become you know uh, that's become uh, porous and when it becomes porous like that um it's uh, we can achieve much i don't see how any serious government can collab the collaborations that we have had with them economically look look at what happened you know in lagos some guys spent 650 million naira to procure motorcycles or motorcycles mm. that people were using with agreement from government and they were operating government wakes up and gives them barely two weeks i mean the government brought them in and give them barely two weeks to stop that business you can imagine so you can imagine how much people have lost mm. so people can do economic issues like that and then you're asking for foreign direct investment how do you think people will now want to work with our security architecture if something happens today and then you go and report to the police have we not had instances of some level of retaliation because the information that you give to security officers were leaked out by the same you know security officers so honestly speaking we're in a dare saddening um, um situation as far as nigeria is concerned there's another call altogether this one is made by the senate and they are saying hey can, can we not cut funding to military Cut funding I, yes the until, more funding. Uh, until until we have accomplished the sacking of the service chiefs is that realistic <laughs> given the peculiarity of circumstances we're dealing with uh, you know you know for for a minute i just wish that we can swap position as one asking asking <laughs> the questions and the reason i'm saying the reason i'm saying so is that uh, for about two three weeks we didn't have the police on the road hmm. the police were quarreling with nigerian citizens what happened uh, boys had a few day hmm. so you can imagine if we now get to where the military will now also say, okay, since we don't want to give us money, eh, we don't work. You know what has happened in this country? We have layers of layers of nation in the nation. Unfortunately, the military has become a nation of its own, running their own constitutions. Because, unfortunately, you see military people be traffic lights, uh, you see military people, they, they, there's no recourse to how the Nigerian constitution works. All right, so um, the military can't even be arrested by the police. In other crimes, the police are the ones who arrest the military. But the military are the ones who are not carrying out, you know, um, civil responsibilities that ordinarily should be carried out, you know, by the police. So when you cut funding, you have a, a I'm sure we would have a more catastrophic situation on our hands. We have seen people on the road who are kidnappers, who are wearing military uniform. And we can't tell, are they real military people who have gone a war, or are they people who bought military uniform and who are doing whatever they are doing? To, tomorrow, we are still denying what happened in the NSAS at Lekito Gate. To tomorrow. So you can imagine the military are asking that. I, I read, um, um, you know, Lai Mohammed and, you know, Mala, Alaji Lai Mohammed is saying that we're going to continue like this mm. until we have global collaborations and that they are setting weapons we are asking to buy. Mm. And those weapons, our attempt to buy those weapons um, met stiff resistance by the international community. And that terrorism is a global thing, and, such, and so we cannot win it locally. So the man is telling us that we need to spend more money to acquire more weapons. So you cannot imagine what now happens if we say we're not going to give the military you know, money. I fear mm. that what we may now have is that we may not have quote and unquote an illegitimate um, insurgency what we may just have is legitimate uh, you know uh, insurgency where the people that were facing themselves are our security architecture our security you know men and women who are protesting for the lack of funds so if we don't have the funds right here so what that happens if there is uh, you know no funds i was just can move into our they can move into our parlor i, I, I was just, i was just wondering how much of difference does it make for the better uh, whether or not the president in any case shows up at the house of representatives to brief the house i mean what difference does he make oh it, it does it does yeah. uh, uh, um, at least one of the things that he tells us that he is abreast of the situation that's one okay. of the things that he tells us um 
I mean, it's, it's like for any reason, um, there's a bit of a situation at home. Even though it has been, you know, put to rest, um, I'm sure that if you were at work and you had a worrisome situation, my wife called you from the house, even when she says, oh, I've put everything under control, I'm sure you probably want to go to your mm -hmm. boss and say, please mm -hmm. give me 10 minutes, I need to rush home, let me see the situation. Yeah, first hand. You know, myself. And when you come into the house, what does he do? He gives your wife assurance. Then he gives your neighbors assurance, okay. And then many of them may even retreat to their houses and say, okay, don't worry. Uh, the husband, you know, is around, mm. okay. But as long as the husband is around, some people think they need to fill the gap, you know, and help her uh, in, in, in ameliorating the situation, depending on how bad it is. Right. It is the same thing. The president is the father of the nation. He's the president of this country. So him coming to the House of Rep, first of all, is one of the tenants of democracy. The boss of Mr. President are the legislators. They should be able to summon him any time on any day mm. to explain, especially his fundamental constitutional responsibility of protecting lives and property. So if he comes, and he first of all shows that he respects democracy and you know, the rule of law and the separations, you know, the sacrosanct separation of powers. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, whatever the president says, we can go to town and hold the president to what he has said. Uh, but when there's no commitment for Mr. President, especially in such accountable, interrogative forum like that, there's nothing, you know, uh, to go to town with. So I, I, I think that it is time for the president to be someone. And if you summon the president in most instances like that, and they mm -hmm. find out that the explanations of the president um, are insufficient, you know, perhaps um, the House of Rep may be emboldened enough to perhaps think about instituting uh, an impeachment proce procedure for Mr. President, which is legitimate. Even before this government, we, we, we've heard cases, report, for example, of um, how that the Boko Haram had um, sponsors and sympathizers from amongst those in power, for example. Is it okay science to finger, I mean, to figure out who those persons are and then bring them to justice as quickly as possible? <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Patrick Uweye, Aziza, former chief of defense staff, mm, mm. former chief of army staff. Under former president, Golub yes, Then became national security advisor. advisor. Mm -hmm. Died in controversial circumstances. Shortly after he said, those who are responsible, he fingered the then People's Democratic, some leadership in the People's Democratic Party as responsible for what was happening in Boko Haram. Soon afterwards, he died in a suspicious helicopter crash, the investigations of which have not been made you know, public today. That's why I say uh, it, 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 there are layers of nations in this part of the world. There are people who are making as much as a billion naira on a daily basis from this insurgency. So they put themselves in what they are in cahoot with each other. So it's a high level conspiracy because we have heard these things again and again. We have heard top government functionaries threatening to say, if you remove me from office, I will tell you who is in the presidency. If you remove me from office, I will tell you who is sponsoring uh, you know, Boko Haram. What it means is that everybody has an idea of why Boko Haram is, you know, so that idea has become a bargaining chip. It's, 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 it's not just become a bargaining chip. It's become like a confraternity. And I tell people that sometimes when you hear confraternities say in court, for instance, they want a, a kind of blood sacrifice. It's not because there is, there is, so to speak, power in that blood sacrifice. It's just sometimes they want to have something against you. So if you have, so if you have killed your wife and I have killed my wife, you can't go on and say, oh, that person killed his wife. You also killed your wife as well. So they are looking mm. for some terrible thing to hold you know, ourselves together so nobody can hold us um, you know, ransom. Right. The, like I said, war is a lot of profit, and there are those who are profiting from it. They know each other very well. So that's why one person threatens. Is that what happens to NNP? I mean, what happens to NLC? Before long, you know, there is, uh, it, there is uh, prices have been uh, increased. Fuel prices have been hiked twice. Mm. You will hear that NLC went on a discussion with Mr. President or mm. the presidency, mm. usually led by Chris Nge. Then you hear they staged a walkout. Then you hear there's another meeting. And then after the second meeting, nothing, mm. you know, happens. And, then, and that has led to more to the fact that perhaps palms have been greased. Not too long ago, fuel was increased again. They stayed another workout. After that workout, you're not here, you know, and it just looks like, you know what, um, 
scratch my back, you know, I scratch it. But just go there, collect your own, uh, when you have the opportunity, and leave the stage for somebody else to collect, uh, you know, his own. So, uh, as a stance right now, what ray of hope do we have at, at the end of the tunnel? This seems to be a very long tunnel, by the way. Uh, well, it looks as if Nigerians have condemned themselves or consoled themselves with the fact that we might just wait for 2023. Okay. Yes, when we would have another election mm. and then we would be able to oust this government you know, out of power. That's what most Nigerians you know, have resolved to do because the very many guys who gathered themselves and spoke in very loud and clear terms right. against President Gulaki, Billy Jonathan, have found themselves in the corridors of power. They're also the ones who mobilized the civil society. Mm. They were also the ones who mobilized uh, a non governmental organization. Them, them, you know, the Tinumbus who formed Nadeko, and a whole lot of them, the Okoyemi Bamidelis, a couple of them, Walesho um, Inka, um, um, Pastor Tunde Bakari, with so many of them. Many of them have now, if they are not in power, they have their friends that they are sentimental towards. That's why it looks like the cry against this non-performing government is not as loud as it was when Gulo Kibido Jonathan was accused of a whole lot of things. But like we say jocularly here, uh, parents say we shouldn't talk when we're eating. Uh, so those who are eating mm. in court now, who are benefiting now... Because that would be, that'll, uh, that'll be yeah, tantamount that'll, to bad table manners. Yeah, so it just looks like Steve, you and I have said, you know what, we'll just bear mm. until 2023 when we can express our despair pleasure mm. by the ballot. our, you know, but hopefully mm. uh, we will still uh, be alive um, to do that, hopefully. And, and, I, and, I, and I said with that hope to be alive to <laughs> cast our votes in 2023, but in the meantime, a lot of work uh, is in front of us to be done, uh, especially as, as far as the uh, dealing with thin security in this country is concerned. Some persons have called it a Bajoni uh, problem, and that is something that should give us a reason uh, not to go to bed as early as we usually uh, would do. Reverend Olu Martins, thank you thank for you coming for on. We, we appreciate it. Just a while ago, I was talking with uh, civil rights activist Reverend Olu Martins, and we're looking at issues around uh, insecurity, state of insecurity in the country, particularly up north of uh, Nigeria, and then what the implications are. Uh, plus, going forward, the things we must do as a country right now to ensure that we'll deal with all of this as quickly as possible. At this point, we want to have your contributions on the show via phone uh, quickly, but please, uh, just before you make the call, be sure to turn down the audio on your television set. And then also be sure, very important, that you're not calling to cast as passion or sling mud on the program. The idea is to have your side of, uh, I mean, just have you lend your voice to the discussion that we're having this morning regarding insecurity in the country. You have those who are saying, look, insecurity is not just in the North. It's a countrywide phenomenon that we all should be concerned about. So along those lines, we want you to uh, lend your voice to the discussion. I'm sure the number is on your screen already. Hello, good morning. Uh, please turn down the audio on your television. Hello, good morning. Okay, I'm sure we lost that, but uh, I guess if you had turned on the audio on your TV site, we probably won't have that uh, kind of uh, feedback. So please be sure you turn down the audio on your television set before you make a call. Hello, good morning. Hello. Yeah, good morning. Welcome to TMI. Hello. Hello, good morning. I can hear you all right. Okay, I'm sure that gentleman couldn't hear me. All right. Okay, good morning. Welcome to TMI. All right, I, I, I think uh, network is a bit nasty, but just uh, ensure that uh, the audio on your TV site is turned down uh, all the way. Hello, good morning. Uh, hello, good morning. Yeah, welcome to TMI. Yeah, this is Comrade Silver calling from Benin. All right, Silver, go ahead and talk to us. All right, the truth is there is one major problem we have in Nigeria. When it is happening in the north, people from the south will say it's none of their business. One, one, the reality of that is the time will come between dawn on everybody that the plan of these people grow beyond what we are seeing right now. The earlier we take the bull by the horn, the earlier we all join hand together and fight against what is gradually coming, the better for all of us. Mm. I so much agree with the comrade that came there. He's speaking the mind of almost every Nigerian that is normal. That is the truth. 
we are tired of what we are seeing. We are tired of turning our television to see RIP to our fellow human, not until we see everybody as one. Nigeria can never move forward. Okay, thank you, Comrade. Uh, we, we, we appreciate that. Um, again, it's obvious that you are uh, clamoring for unity and, of course, uh, oneness in the fight against uh, insurgency. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Okay, I'm sure uh, that uh, person couldn't hear me. Hello, good morning. Yeah, good morning, sir. Yes, welcome to the program. Yes, uh, my name is Osa. I'm calling uh, in reference to the subject you are talking about. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say that um, it appears that the members of the House of Rep and the Senate, uh, well, I don't want to be extreme. I would say that most of them are robbers. No, you, 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 you cannot, uh, I'll have to cut you off. Uh, I, I beg to differ. I, I said earlier that the idea is not to cast a smash or sling mode. We're, we're looking at the issues from the perspective of finding solutions. A lot of persons have talked about new ideas. I mean, how that we must have a new approach to the fight against insurgency. Those are the issues we're looking at, not to call uh, people names. I mean, you can prove that they are robots, for example. At least I'm not sure you have that evidence. All right. Hello, good morning. Yes, yeah, good to have you on the program. Tell me your name and location. I'm All right, Mafidon, go ahead. Okay, what I want to talk about for this good morning on Thai TV is just that for our country and Nigeria, we do have a good leader. Mostly our president, Wari, everything is going up and down. People are dying for me. We need good leaders. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you, Imafido. Uh, you're saying that leadership has to improve. We must provide leadership to be able to deal with this problem. But please, let's stay with the issues. Uh, that is the goal of this uh, interaction. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Yeah, my name is Comrade Abi. I'm calling from Minnesota. Abi, it's always a pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you very much. Uh, the issue of the insecurity in Nigeria is just a fortunate that they are not taking it so very serious. As for me, let them change all the service chiefs. It's paying a lot of like I will have on that time. They are not giving out what the assignments are uh, that they are supposed to do. They are not doing it very well. So an injury to one is supposed to be an injury to all. We are just taking this thing for granted. As for me, all the service chiefs they have not done well. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Abby. Uh, that's your assessment of the situation. You're saying the service chiefs have, have not done well and the such. Uh, there is need to have them replaced, which essentially has been the call, really, from all quarters, from even uh, institutions of, of government. All right. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Yes, welcome to the program. Um, my name is Benazimo Tarela, and I'm calling from Benin. All right, make your contribution. Um, what my own contribution is that the Nigerian government should at least appreciate the security personnel because it's not easy to be a security personnel in this country. Hmm. You know, in the aspect of pay, you need to pay them a suitable kind of amount of money that will enable them to do their job happily. You cannot expect a man to receive low kind of salary and you expect him to protect lives and properties. Hmm. You know, so that's why I think that the Nigerian government should at least increase the pay cuts of the Nigerian security. Hmm. Thank you. Uh, you. You are talking about remuneration and, of course, overall welfare for men and women in uniform. That has always been a very critical angle uh, to the conversation. But some persons are saying we are not having that conversation enough. And then the question is, what more can Nigerians do about that when we'll still get to hear that men and women in uniform are uh, not taking adequate care of? I mean, how do you send people, for example, to the battle lines and then you don't take good care of them. You don't uh, put their welfare into serious consideration. That, again, will be uh, another layer to the problem overall. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning, my brother. Yes, uh, please tell me your name and your location. My name is Sam. I'm speaking from Jerry. All right, Sam, make a contribution. Uh, my contribution is that the problem of security in this Nigeria a lie in the hand of government. Anything that you know that you refuse not go in the nation, you will know that it's the government that's behind it. So we should hold government responsible. 
Thank you for my contribution. Thank you for your contribution. You're saying that um, government has the responsibility to pro uh, protect lives and, of course, uh, property. Uh, that has always been the discussion, essentially. Okay, uh, let's just take uh, two more calls before we're done uh, with the segment of the program. Hello, good morning. Hello, good morning. Yes, welcome to the program. Uh, let me have your name and location quickly. All right. We, 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 can, we, can, we can hardly hear you. You probably want to project your voice a little. Okay. Are you hearing me now? It's better. Okay. So, the point I'm trying to make is that when we are clamoring for, when the House of Paper is clamoring for the President to come to the National Assembly and address them, we don't expect that they want to come to the Because this is that what happens in NPAP when we are clamoring for the President to address the public, address the nation. So, from the first question, this is about the city has served. Then it's an issue of the way the citizens. The only thing we need is the police. I do think that the police or the security agents are across the world. We can be able to support what has been done now. No one can support. Thank you, my brother from uh, Jerry, uh, for that call. Uh, we, we do appreciate it. But we want to tie it up here at this point, uh, so uh, we can take a quick break. But just to say that this issue has become increasingly of more interest to Nigerians, which is ideally what it should be. But going forward, concrete, measurable solutions uh, are the things that we need to see. So we're taking a quick break now. We'll take a few more calls after this break. Do stay with me. It has often been said that security is everyone's business. However, the fact that government and in particular the authorities concerned must provide leadership, of course, cannot be overemphasized. I'm very sure Nigerians are tired of hearing about killings across this country on a daily basis. A lot of persons have said that it's uh, probably indicative of how much we probably don't value lives, which of course is not the truth, which shouldn't be in any case. But we must show that we place premium on lives by the amount of investment that we make uh, in ensuring that lives and property are, are secured or protected at all times. So thank you everyone for being a part of the program this morning. We do appreciate that time. We are Mofwegwe. Remember that the views of our guests are their opinions. Our coverage on ITV continues. Good morning.